I invite you to join me from your seats as we sing the verse, first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 88 in your hymnals. be with you. Uh, every week during Advent, we're going to sing one of the first four verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, I'm Pastor Dexter, and sadly, Pastor Liz is uh, sick this week. Uh, it seems that I may have passed on whatever I had to her. My apologies to all of you. Uh, well, we wish her deep rest and healing today. I want to welcome you to Longview Presbyterian Church. We are a community of faith that is seeking Christ's way and welcoming all people. And in this season of Advent, when we wait for Christ to be born to us in the form of a vulnerable baby, we recognize that that story continues even in the waiting, as signified by the animals. We've got camels, cows, sheep, 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 and a donkey. <laughs> Uh, this morning as they were added to our nativity set by uh, Charlotte, Abram, and Blake. Thank you so much. Uh, this season, Christian Education has several opportunities for you to engage in a home study uh, during this Advent season. First, we are kicking off a year-long home devotional that follows the lectionary. The lectionary is a preset series of readings for Protestant denominations all around the world. Uh, we're going to start reading that today, Sunday, November 27th, at the beginning of the church year. Uh, there's two more copies there at the back. Feel free to grab one and start. Uh, if we run out, let me know, and I will quickly order you a new one. Um, those are free to whoever would like them, but if you would like to offset the cost, they're about $30 each. We also invite you to start the Advent devotionals today. So if you're really in a devotional mood, we've got lots of great opportunities for you. The Advent devotionals come to us from a sanctified art, and they have some beautiful art, poetry, readings, and reflections in them. Those are also starting today. Uh, I read the first one this morning. It's a beautiful poem. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to participate in that as well. And families and anyone else who would like, we have Advent calendars, uh, which have a little activity for you every day to do as a family, as an individual, uh, to stay connected to this Advent season. Um, those are all available at the back. Um, grab one after church. We hope you'll join us for our discussion of We Cry Justice, uh, a book study alongside the Poor People's Campaign that we will continue today at 2 p.m. on Zoom using the same Zoom church link it's right there on the front page of our website. Remember to read chapters 42 through 45 before the discussion. And even if you perhaps missed that reading, join us anyways, we would love to have you there. And then we invite you to join us this Thursday, December 1st at 7.30 p.m. right here in the sanctuary or on Zoom for our monthly service of healing and wholeness. This will be an hour-long service of scripture and song, of silence and prayer. Everyone is welcome and we will have childcare available at that service. I now invite the Ledgerwood family forward to lead us in our call to worship and our first Advent candle lighting. Good morning. Over a hundred people from the ages of two to 80 years old were asked the question, what gives you hope? From the voices of different generations, hear their answers. My two grandchildren. Dogs wagging their tails. Talking with young people. Kindness from strangers. Spending time in the woods. Waffles. 
<laughs> Hands clasped in prayer. Social progress. The way my son calls everybody buddy. The ringing of church bells. Trying over and over, oh, sorry. Babies trying over and over to take their first step. The turning of seasons. Christian community. Books. Friendship with my adult children. Advocates for justice. Hearing children in the pews singing the hymns. The sunrise every single morning. What gives you hope? Today we light the candle of hope to remind ourselves that God is at work in this world. From generation to generation, God has brought good news of love and compassion, justice and community. Let us rest and abide in that good news. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit to sing along with our opening hymn, number 82, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. may take or keep your seat. Uh, it's time for our kids' time. I'd like to invite forward all the kids to just come join me up here next to our uh, beautiful nativity with our different animals. Uh, I know it's a little intimidating, but uh, uh, just you can hang out here with me. Don't have to look at all these people. I know that's sometimes weird. <laughs> so, hi, good to see you. <laughs> So I'm glad you're here at church today as we get ready to celebrate Jesus's birthday. Don't you kind of wish that they celebrated your birthday all month long? I do kind at of. least, yeah, I take that. So today is the first Sunday in Advent and the word Advent means coming toward because we are coming toward Christmas. So there's four Sundays in Advent. Uh, so today uh, we can say that there's only four more Sundays before Christmas. Mm. <laughs> it might seem like forever, but trust me, it gets pretty busy, uh, and it's a time we get to celebrate um, because we're so glad that Jesus was born. So to remind us of that, we've got four candles. This is for everyone to learn here. This is four candles here for the four Sundays of Advent, um, and they stand for four special gifts that we think Jesus brought to us to remember. Gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love. So today we lit the first candle, the candle of hope. What are some things that you guys might hope for? Shout it out. Any hopes? 
Snow, peace. Waffles, yes. I know, who said that this morning? That made me. <laughs> and pancakes. And pancakes, oh man. These are great ideas. So sometimes I think that hope is kind of like a flight of stairs. As we climb up in hope, our hopes get higher and higher and bigger and bigger. But I left my stairs at home today. If only we could find a ladder. You guys see a ladder anywhere around here? A ladder? Oh my gosh, Sheldon brought a ladder. What a coincidence. <laughs> Sheldon is always prepared with a ladder. All right, would you just set it up right there for me? This is why you came 15 minutes earlier than us. <laughs> Oh, did, did you fi figure us out? Yeah, 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 there we go. All right, so let's start at the bottom of the ladder. Blake, would you go stand at the bottom? Sure. All right. At first, maybe we have hope at the first rung of the ladder just for ourselves. Like we might say, I hope that I'm gonna get a lot of presents for Christmas. Yeah. Those are good hopes. <laughs> All right, Blake, go ahead and step down. Would someone like to go to the second step for me? Oh. Can you go up one more? You got it? Yeah, you feel good there? Okay, that's great, if you feel good there. So on the second step, we remember that other people have hopes too, not just us. So we might say, I hope my family and my friends get lots of presents too, right? That's a good step up, huh? All right, you can step down now. And then we climb up a little higher. Do you think you can go to the top, Charlotte? You got it? Yeah. <laughs> so we climb a little bit higher, and we remember that Jesus taught us to have hope for all God's children all over the world, not just us. All right, you can step down now. Thanks, Charlotte. And the fourth one is just the railing. And just the railing at the top, that's right. <laughs> so that's a lot of hope as we go higher and higher. Hope for everybody in the world, wow. So what can we do to help bring hope to others who might not have hope? in this time. So some people might live here in town and not have any hope. Maybe there's some, some kids at school that don't have any hope. So maybe we can help them with gifts or friendship. Maybe we can bake them some cookies or waffles to share. Or pancakes. Or pancakes, because sharing is a great way to spread hope. Um, so at the top of the ladder, we might sit down and stop and think about this thing called hope. Maybe the best hope, the highest hope of all, is the hope that Jesus gives us. And the Bible tells us that even when we are sad, Jesus gives us this present of hope. Jesus always hopes for us and never gives up. So today we give thanks for the gift of hope, that this beautiful candle that was maybe a little hard to light, just like hope, sometimes it takes a little bit to get going, but once it's lit, it burns brightly, doesn't it? We, this beautiful candle of hope that shines for us today. So I have a hope. Do you know what that hope is? I hope everyone will join me in a repeat after me prayer. Yeah! <laughs> All right, I'll say a line and then I invite everyone to join me in a line afterwards. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus you, are you are the hope that we need. Because you were born, we can be hopeful children of God. Today we say thank you. For the hope that comes with Christmas. Help us to climb the ladder of hope this Advent. And help us to share the hope of Jesus with everyone we know. With everyone we know. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you guys for being good troopers, for climbing that ladder. You guys can head back. Sheldon, thank you for randomly having this ladder. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. In God's house, this space and all the spaces, everyone is welcome. Those who might seem like they have it together and those who feel like their world is falling apart. No matter who you are, no matter who we are, there is room for us here. So, with that confidence, we turn to God in prayer, 
speaking the truth of our lives. In humility and trust, let us start our confession by naming that the land our church occupies was stolen by white settlers from the Calitz Indian tribe. Our confession invites God to help us turn around in a new direction, a new direction of solidarity with the original indigenous stewards of this land. This month, we have a way to act in solidarity with the tribe. As part of the Indigenous Heritage Month, the Longview Public Library is inviting the larger community to join them on Tuesday, November 29th at 6 p.m. That's this Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the magazine reading room at the, at the Longview Library. This will be an evening with Cowlitz elder and spiritual leader, Tana Engdahl, as she discusses and presents a slideshow on the history of the Cowlitz people. Engdahl will share her perspective on Cowlitz culture and preservation, as well as tribal relations and will participate in a discussion with staff and guests. Uh, both Liz and I plan on attending, Liz, if she gets better in time. Uh, but if you'd like to attend, just let us know and we'll make sure we'll have a little group gathered there together. I invite you now to join me in our call and response land acknowledgement. It is vital to honor those who came before us. This area has been home to the Cowlitz Indian tribe and the ancestors of the Cowlitz Indian tribe for thousands of years. The land with its rich resources enabled the Cowlitz people to flourish, and they stewarded the land with their traditional culture. Today, we must appreciate the persistence of the Cowlitz people and the important role they play in our region. We continue in a time of confession with our call and response confessing prayer. God of today and God of tomorrow, you say, bring your full self. There is room for you here. We say, you say, bring your hopes and your dreams. There's room for you here. But we say, you say, Bring your grief and your prayers. There is room for you here. God of today and God of tomorrow, we know in our hearts that there is room for us here. Help us remember today and tomorrow Family of faith, we who feel scattered are held together. We who have lost our way are forgiven and found. And we who are lonely are brought into the fold and told, there is room for you here. From generation to generation, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are held, found, forgiven, and welcomed. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen? It's time for us to pass that peace of Christ to one another. Feel free to use our traditional sign language. Peace be with you. And pass it back and also with you. Or you can use the words we're accustomed to using as you share that around. So LPC family, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Feel free to share it. Peace, George. Peace, Clayton and Carol. John. Sherry. I think you can unmute if you want, George. Peace, everyone. Que la paz de Dios esté con vosotros. Gracias. Gracias. Oh, got, got a collection of people this morning. Yeah. Not wearing masks. No. Nope. Gotta pay the price down yeah. the line.
Looks like Robert's got a cold. Doesn't that just feel so, so peaceful? I love that. As you make your way to your seats, I invite Jan to lead us in our prayer for illumination and the first reading of scripture. God of the ages, in scripture we hear stories of people like us, ordinary people, people who longed to know you, people who longed to follow you, people who made mistakes, people who tried to grow, old, young, native, immigrant, new to the faith, lifelong believer, in scripture, we hear stories of people like us. So just as you walked with them, help us to hear and remember all the ways that you walk with us. We are listening. We are grateful. We are yours. Amen. Our reading this, this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Let us listen to God's word. The word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate <clears throat> between the many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's sermon is entitled, Creating New Families Out of Thin Air, a sermon written and prepared by Pastor Liz, who, due to an illness, is not able to deliver it today, so I will do my best. Our gospel reading today comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter beginning in verse 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Aminadab. And, of course, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Simon. And Simon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconah and his brothers. At the time of the deportation to Babylon. <sighs> and... After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconah was the father of Salatiel, and Salatiel the father of Zerubbabel, 
and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliad, and Eliad, the father of Eliazor, Eliazor, the father of Methan, and Methan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of God. (laughs) It's important to know that Matthew's decision to open his gospel with this genealogy of Jesus was right in line with Jewish tradition. These genealogies appear often throughout the Old Testament and were always less concerned with getting the exact biological ancestry correct and more interested in invoking particular stories of their ancestors. These stories that would explain how we got here. Honestly, maybe your family does a version of this too. Uh, Gathered around uh, Liz's parents' table, uh, she remembers her dad telling the stories of the discrimination that her grandpa Ole faced when he emigrated from Norway as a 12-year-old boy. And she remembers the stories her mom would tell her about how her grandma Barbara quit her smoking habit, cold turkey, the day she realized she needed that money to buy Liz's mom a new pair of shoes. Those stories aren't just historical facts. They're moments in time when Liz's parents lifted up again and again these stories to tell her something about how they ended up where they were and what kind of things mattered going forward. Whew, and goodness gracious, what was learned this week is that this genealogy is a fascinating story of radical inclusion to fold us into as we look back through the generations that brought us to Jesus. First, we see that this genealogy names five women with wild stories. If you follow along in our daily Advent devotional, which starts today and is available in the back, (laughs) you'll read more about them this Tuesday. The artist and Reverend Lauren Wright Pittman writes in this Tuesday reflection that each of these women took their life and survival into their own hands. They were catalysts who propelled the lineage forward. Tamar, when her rights were snubbed by her father-in-law after the death of her husband, she tricked her father-in-law into getting her pregnant with twins so that her family line wouldn't stop with her. Rahab, the Canaanite sex worker, sheltered Israelite spies in Jericho and secured a place for herself and her family because of her bravery. Ruth, a Moabite woman, cleverly and bravely navigated her way through a patriarchal system to make sure that she and her mother-in-law had shelter and food after their husbands had died. And the so-called wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, she has a name, survived sexual assault by King David himself and made sure that her son, Solomon, was the one to take the throne of Israel. Scholar Amy Jill Levine writes that these women are not sinners, as some early church fathers suggested. She says, were sin the genealogy's concern, then many of the men listed would also be great candidates. No. These these women did what women have done since the beginning, scraped and scrapped to make a way when there is no way. They crafted a path through trauma, through grief, through patriarchal absurdity, so that they could make a better life for their children and their children's families. Here's another feature about this genealogy to note. You may have noticed that this line leads all the way to Joseph, Mary's husband, someone who is not biologically related to Jesus. So what is that? Is it just more patriarchal oppression, making this about tracing lineage through a man, even though it was Mary whose body gave birth to Jesus without Joseph's help? Maybe. But given Matthew's inclusion of some of the Gentile women in this genealogy, 
there's another explanation to consider. What we know is that Joseph essentially adopted Jesus. At his own and Mary's peril, he refused the path of putting Mary at risk by throwing her out when she found out she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Instead, he stayed. He stayed by Mary's side and claimed Jesus as his own son. There are some scholars today who would say that this is Matthew's way of affirming adoption as a pathway to parenthood and the pathway that is just as legitimate and thoroughly real as becoming a biological parent. After all, any of us who are not Jewish are considered adopted into the family of God through Jesus. So running this family line through Joseph is one way to say that God is a God who does not need biology to make a new family. God makes real families, kin, out of thin air. Because our God who created the world with a word is a God who can make new families out of anyone, everyone, all of us. And these oddities in the genealogy, they aren't just historical facts. They are moments in time that Matthew is lifting up at the very beginning of this story to tell us something about how God's people ended up where they are and what kind of things will matter as they go forward. So as we've heard today, the message is clear. In God's kingdom, we are called to make family out of each other, even when that seems impossible. Not burying the trauma or the pain that we've been through, but laying it out in the open in our storytelling, so that the world will know that the Spirit helped make a way for us. Not limiting the ways that we become kin to one another to biology, but adopting one another into deep, intimate bonds that show everyone around us that there is always, always more room at the table for them to find welcome. This is hope. It's hope, that word we lit a candle for today. When you're sharing breakfast with your unhoused friends at the shelter, you're right there in God's kind of family, making kin where no one expected it. If you're a member of the queer community, crafting deep relationships in communities of care, despite the ways your own biological families may not embrace you, you're right there in God's kind of family, making kin even out there in the wilderness. When you're reaching across the boundaries that society has engineered to keep us divided and standing in solidarity with those targeted by systems of greed, you're right there in God's kind of family, making kin where it was not supposed to appear. When you're more concerned with every being finding welcome at your table than making sure to follow all the rules, you're right there in God's kind of family, making kin out of thin air. A strange uh, numerical note about this genealogy. There's 14 generations between Abraham and David, and then another 14 between David and the Babylonian captivity, which scholars have said is likely a symbol completion, symbol of completion, since 14 is 2 times 7, and 7 is the number associated with wholeness in Jewish thought. But if anyone was paying close attention, which I haven't historically with the genealogies, <laughs> there's only 13 generations named, with Jesus being the 13th from the Babylonian captivity to Jesus. I've been a pastor for many years. This is the first time I've known this. And guess what? Scholars believe that this is because Matthew wants us to know that the 14th generation, the final generation, is that of the church. The end of this genealogy has left an open question from Matthew to us. Will we take our turn in this lineage as the 14th generation? Will we join in the saints who came before us 
in being wild weavers of new kinds of family that disrupt oppressive social norms and make ways of belonging out of no way? Will we? <clears throat> I'll leave you with this poem, <coughs> excuse me, that was written for this Sunday by the Reverend Sarah Speed of A Sanctified Art, the organization that provided most of our liturgy today. Hear now these words reminding us that even in the wildly woven family of God, there is always, always room. This is a poem entitled, Room. <clears throat> I asked God, what about my fingernail biting habit? Or the way I leave all the cabinets open in the kitchen? What about the way I can be dramatic, drumming up a fight only to hand out apologies like souvenirs? What about the way I second guess myself, let shame drive or stay quiet when I have something to say? What about the way I chase accomplishments like a dog with a bone? What about the doubt or the fact that I'm terrible at prayer and cannot help but yawn during church? What about, what about, what about? My baggage might be too big for the van. But then, God called me by my first and middle name, which always means business, and said, who told you that you were too much? Sugar, there is so much room for you here. So that's when I grabbed a seat and we hit the road and I knew right then that the rumors were true. There is room. There is room. Say it with me. There is room. Amen. Amen. I now invite you to st uh, rise in body or in spirit to sing along with our responding hymn, number 102, Savior of the Nations Come. take or keep your seat. We continue in worship in a time of prayer. We share our joys and our concerns for communal prayer. You can send your chats uh, to Zoom. Uh, you can always fill out the prayer sheet when you enter the sanctuary. You can also raise your hand so that I can come to you and bring a microphone for you to share your prayer requests. Um, I'll do the written prayers and then I will run around the sanctuary, uh, if that's all right with everybody. At the end of each prayer, uh, we invite you, I will say, God in your grace, to end the prayer. 
and I invite you, if you feel comfortable, to respond, you receive our prayers, O God. We'll end with a prayer of silence for the prayer concerns that feel just too intimate to be shared publicly at this time. We know that God receives those prayers, the deepest cries of our hearts. So let us pray. We pray during our 50th year, Holy One, a prayer of thanks for our harvest and Christmas baskets. We know that we have an abundance and the only way to create your world is through sharing of resources. Thank you for this sharing in our past and in our present and in our future, for this glimpse of your reign here on earth. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. We pray with John Steppert a prayer of thanks, Holy One, for the six people from our church who spoke passionately at last Tuesday's Cowlitz County Commissioners meeting urging them to use the document recording fees to help financially with the operation and management of Hope Village run by the Salvation Army. Thank you, Lord, for their faithful witness. And we also pray alongside John, uh, we pray fervently that our political leaders, our elected officials would come to their senses, cut their ties with the NRA, and pass laws that regulate the purchase and responsible use of all guns. Healing One, bring comfort to those who've lost loved ones in the past week's deadly shootings. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. And we continue with that prayer, with a prayer from Teresa, um, lifting up the victims of the Colorado Club shooting. Holy One, into a safe space like that club, when horror pours in and raised, rains down, we ask that you turn our thoughts and our prayers into action, changing us from the inside, erasing any homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia from us so that we can go out and erase it from our world. Change the hearts of those who need to be changed, but more importantly, hold those who have been victimized and attacked. Surround them with community that will hold them and love them in this time of fear and anxiety and pain. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. Are there any Zoom prayers? Uh, George Brito would like to share prayers of gratitude for his wife, Veronica. For, sorry. His wife, Veronica. Absolutely. Let us pray with George. Holy One, we give you thanks for George and his wife, Veronica. Uh, continue to bless them and watch over them um, in all of the ups and downs of life. Watch over their relationship and bring them great joy and blessing. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. Any more? All right, I'm going to walk around now. There. Just gotta look around. <laughs> uh, my name's Merle, and you know that uh, we're involved in one prisoner, one parish, and this is a joy and concern. Um, the joy is we finally had gotten all of our DOC gathering together, and we could receive a phone call from our new friend Gabriel, and we enjoyed that, and he explained that it's such a joy that his he hasn't had family contact for a long time and our letters and that are becoming the new family and we had an enjoyable conversation and joy but on the other side is as his release date comes up most of us would think that this would be a time of joy and excitement this has become a time of anxiety and fear because the concern is do you have housing do you have jobs how do you integrate and he's been through this several times, but he's excited that he has a new family to be with him. So prayers of joy and concern. Let us pray. Holy One, we lift up Gabriel to you as he faces the anxiety of release, the moving back into a community where there are a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, a lot of unknowns, a lot of um, worry. 
We pray for the OPOP team that they would surround him like a family and care for him and watch over him, that they would be a friend to him in these difficult times and that it would be a blessing to both of them in this relationship. God, in your grace, prayer for mom and for unspoken prayer for Ladon and for me to find a place soon in my price range. Let us pray with Melvina. Gracious God, we, we first lift up Cynthia, who is mourning the loss of multiple friends in the past weeks. Hold her close as she grieves and goes through this painful time. Surround her with her loving church community as well as her family and friends to watch over her in this time. We lift up Ladon, you know what is happening in his life, and we ask that you would surround him with your grace and your care. And we especially want to pray for Melvina as she continues to search for housing. Um, we know that there is a huge shortage in our community, God, and we pray that a way would be opened up, that this community would surround Melvina in helping make a way out of no way. God, in your grace, receive our prayers. I'd like to offer a prayer of concern for Pastor Liz and also a prayer of joy uh, for tackling such a sermon text, which is seldom preached on, but so important. And Dex let her know that that was the best sermon she never preached. <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> Holy One, we, uh, we just ask for prayers of deep rest and healing for Liz and for all those who are facing sickness this day. We know it is running rampant in our community right now. Uh, send your restorative spirit to each and every one of them to bring them back into fullness of health. Um, and we give thanks, God, for Liz and the way she tackled uh, what could have been a very boring and difficult sermon uh, with grace and with laughter. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. I invite you to join me in a prayer of silence, uh, lifting up the prayer concerns on our hearts that feel too heavy uh, to be spoken aloud right now. We know God receives those prayers. Let us pray. God, in your grace, receive our prayers, O oh God. And we pray together to our parenting God, mother and father of us all, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mystic and community spiritual advisor, Julian of Norwich, lived in a time that felt like the world was ending. Extraordinary floods, a horrific plague, and persistent violence made her landscape not unlike our own. During this time, she wrote, where do we begin? Begin with the heart. Beloveds, let us begin with our hearts, touching it for wisdom and compassion that amidst a rattling world, we might build structures of love. Let us bring forth our offerings that it may be so. Today, we have an opportunity to give financially to the work of Christ through this church. We love God and want to share that love with others. Recognizing that we often give in ways other than financial, we invite you to fill out the little offering slips uh, in your the back of the pew, the, the back of the chairs. Um, 
There's a lot of different colors in there. To fill those out with your gifts of time and talent that you've gave this last week, and you can place those in the plate as well. The worship team and pastors are collecting those, and we'll be displaying them here under the cross, a symbol of how we follow Christ in self-giving love. Let's celebrate all the gifts that make us the body of Christ. We're now going to enjoy a special offertory, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, arranged by Sally DeFord and shared by vocalists Robert Mumford, Alan Ledgerwood, and Ron Marshall with pianist Noel Carlson.
mysterious peace, root our gifts in the ways of love. When we feel distracted, focus our hearts on the everyday practices of the fruits of the Spirit. When we scramble for hope, ease our bodies into the flow of your grace. Ground our offerings in these intentions that all manner of things may be well. Amen. I invite you to join us for our sending hymn number 94, Now the Heavens Start to Whisper. take or keep your seat. Thank you so much for joining us at Longview Presbyterian Church. After the benedicts, benediction, we'll enjoy a postlude from our church musician, Noel, and we invite you to join us afterwards for a time of fellowship, either in person, I think we have some goodies, and on Zoom, you're welcome to stay around and chat as well. Now receive this benediction. <clears throat> as you leave this place, may you go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been on our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you, and calls you forth saying, go, be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. May it be so. Amen? Amen.